Okay, uh, scene three, the palace of the King of England. Uh, we know that Malcolm has fled to England. We know that Macduff, uh, upon uh, the couple scenes ago, Macbeth has heard that Macduff has gone to England as well. Um, and so this particular scene is very important because we haven't seen Malcolm before. Um, he, well, we did see him, but he was kind of just a, a side character. From here on out, he becomes one of the main characters. He is the rightful King of England, the heir to the throne. Okay, and now we have Macduff has come here to bring him back, bring back the true king of Scotland. Now, if you were Malcolm, would you trust Macduff right away? Some guy comes back and says, hey, come on back. Remember, they fled because there were daggers in men's smiles. Somebody killed daddy while we were sleeping in the other room. Okay, Macduff could be uh, an agent of Macbeth to bring us back or bring me back, I guess, and then bring his brother back from Ireland. And so he's very skeptical of it. This particular scene can really be divided up into two sections. The first one is Malcolm and Macduff conversing, and Malcolm is actually going to test Macduff. Okay, he tests him, and he tests his loyalty and tests his word. Okay, the second half deals with Ross coming and Malcolm and uh, Macduff talking with Ross and Macduff finding out about his family uh, being killed and then ultimately, um, you know, what uh, his feelings and emotions are at the very end. Um, and that gets us ramped up in anticipation of a final confrontation in Act 5. And that's the big conclusion and climax and resolution. <laughs>
Um, bu- 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 the bottom of the page, uh, McDuff, you know, Malcolm starts to question McDuff, and McDuff goes, I'm not treacherous. You have nothing to fear from me, in essence. I am not treacherous. Ah, but Macbeth is. A good and virtuous nature may recoil in an imperial charge. So a good person, a good, honest person, they might not be so good and honest when charged, when ordered to do so by the person in charge. And so he's going to test him here. Um, Malcolm, line 26, he goes, why in that rawness, why in Scotland, why in that horrible place left you wife and child? Those precious motives, those strong knots of love without leave taking. Isn't that the question that kind of we asked and Lady Macduff was asking earlier? You know, if Scotland's so bad, why did he leave us? And then we kind of hypothesized, you know, maybe he didn't have time. Uh, maybe he thought he could get there and back without being found out. Uh, maybe they would just slow him down. Maybe he didn't think it was that bad, you know, that they were immediately going to be, um, you know, set upon like that. Um, but he asked this question, you know, if it's so bad, why did you leave your loved ones there? So he starts to question him. Um, the test starts to be played there in the middle of the page. Um, our country seeks beneath the yoke. It weeps, it bleeds, and each new day a gash is added to her wounds. Line 46, yet my poor country shall have more vices than it had before, more suffer, and more sundry ways than ever by him that shall succeed. So Scotland is in a bad shape right now. There are new gashes and new wounds happening daily. But there will be more vices and more evil in this land by he that succeeds Macbeth. <laughs> what should he be? Who should he be? Well, it's myself, I mean. It's myself in whom I know all the particulars of vice so grafted that when they shall be opened, black Macbeth will seem as pure as snow. So I, only, I alone know of my vices and my, my, uh, my indiscretions. But when everybody knows upon them and I have the power of the king, it will make black Macbeth look pure as, wa- pure as snow, white. Okay. Well, sure, that can't be. Not in the legions of horrid hell can a devil more damned than evils to top Macbeth. You know, I grant, you know, him bloody, luxurious, avaricious, false, deceitful, you know, malicious, blah, blah, blah. But there's no bottom, none, in my voluptuousness. Your wives and your daughters, your matrons and your maids could not fill up the cistern of my love. And so his main fault that he leads out with Because he's hoping that Macduff will call him on this, okay? If somebody is truly trying to get Malcolm to come back to Macbeth, they'll say anything so that Malcolm will come. Does that make sense? And so he's thrown out the worst possible scenario to see if if, uh, Macduff will look past that and go, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, we can deal with that. Come on, come on, come back. He wouldn't trust somebody like that. And so his test is to see if Macduff will speak up against this particular individual, and that's Malcolm. And so that's a test. So the first is, I will sleep with your wives, your daughters, your matrons, your maids, all the women. There is no bottom to my voluptuousness. That's his first thing. The response from Macduff, um, you know, ultimately the last three or four lines, he goes, there cannot be that vulture in you to devour so many as will to greatness dedicate themselves. Surely there isn't that vulture in you that would have to take all these women. But you know, you'll be the king and you'll have power. There will be plenty of women who will volunteer to be with you. So we can deal with this vice of yours. That's no problem. We can handle this situation. You might want to look at that as maybe strike one against Macduff. That he doesn't, you know, he doesn't combat him. Um, The second one, you know, were I king, I should cut off the nobles for their lands, desire his jewels and this other's house, and blah, 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 that I should forge quarrels unjust against the good and loyal, destroying them for wealth. So I'm going to wreak havoc upon the country and take anything and everything that I want to make myself wealthy. And those people that are good and just, I will, you know, wreak havoc and ruin their lives so that I can have more material possessions and more gold. Macduff, yet... Do not fear Scotland has poisons, supplies, to fill up your will of your mere own. So there is plenty 
we have plenty in Scotland that no matter how much you want, I'm sure we will be able to give you what you need. Okay? So that's second vice years. That's we can deal with this. We can manage with this. So in Malcolm's mind, you can be thinking, okay, well, that's strike two. Okay? Because I'm telling you all these horrible things, and yet you're making excuses for how I would still be a good ruler, a good person for you, and a, mainly not just for you, but for Scotland, because that's the ultimate one. Um, but I have none of the king becoming graces. I have none of these, of justice and verity and temperance, perseverance, mercy, patience, courage, those things that people should have. I have none of these. I have no relish of them. I, I, there's no trace of them. I don't have any of these, a whiff of these, a sniff of these in me. Nay, had I power, I should pour the sweet milk of concord into hell, uproar the universal peace and confound all unity on earth. So really just be the worst Sith Lord in the world here. Okay, Star Wars reference. Okay, the worst possible person and wreak havoc in hell across the entire world if I had the power and if I were king. Look at Macduff's response. Oh, Scotland. Scotland. If such a one be fit to govern, speak. I am as I have spoken. So if you think that I should be king, speak up because I am like I say I am. And that's the king that I shall be. Fit to govern. No, you're not fit to live. Oh, nation, miserable. Now Macduff is going to win. He can't keep quiet any longer. Because of all the stuff that he said, it was so horrible. And Scotland is in such a bad state right now that he was thinking, we're going to you know, have the angels come back and Malcolm will come back and it'll be wonderful. But now I'm finding out that he's going to be even worse than Macbeth. And so look at the, the way Scotland's going to play out. It's going to not be a very good place and not a very good country. And that's why he's almost weeping for, oh, Scotland, Scotland. Um, Macduff is just questioning, you know, um, you know, Scotland, when shalt thou see thy wholesome days again? Line 105, the purple, thy royal father was a most sainted king. The queen, she was on her knees praying more times than she was up on her feet. So you had saintly parents. How can you be the way that you are? So he's saying everything that a good, noble Scot, a true person should be saying. And Malcolm lets, you know, drops the hammer on him on the next page. Um, Macduff, this noble passion, child of integrity, hath from my soul wiped the black scruples, reconciled my thoughts to thy good truth and honor. So your truth has wiped away everything that I had just said a little bit ago. He refers to, you know, devilish Macbeth. He goes on to say, you know, I've never lied before until what I just did to you. And so he's going to tell him everything of his plan leading into war, but ultimately that everything I told you was a fake and it was a test and you passed. He says, you know, remember the first thing was being voluptuous, you know, for, I'll sleep with all the women. He goes, I am yet unknown to woman. Never was forsworn. You know, I've never broken my oath. I've never lied. I've never been with a woman yet. Okay, I've never lied except what I just told you a little bit ago. I have scarcely have coveted what was mine own. And at no time have I broke my faith. I would not betray the devil to his fellow and delight no less in truth than life. My first false speaking was this upon myself. What I am truly in thine and my co poor countries to command. Whether indeed before thy here approach, old seaward. So now he's going to say, you know, if you don't believe me. Okay. Before you even approached, old Seward, a general in the English army, the king of England has given us a, an army of 10,000 English to march against Macbeth. So this sounds like a wondrous thing. So we, Malcolm is not sitting back. He is already going to do what Macduff came here to get him to do. Um, you know, why are you so silent, the last line there of Malcolm's. Why are you so silent, Macduff's? Such welcome and unwelcome things at once. It's hard to reconcile. He's a little bit in shock. He heard all those horrible things. He was, well, think, his motivation would be there. You're going to save us. You're going to save us. Man, you're a horrible person. Oh, gosh, Scotland's in a worse shape now. Than ever. Oh, wait, you're lying? To, oh, that was a game? Huh? Oh, wait, so we are going to attack, and we will become king again? And, oh, that's just too much. I need to sit down a minute.
So McDuff is happy about this, but he's just had an emotional roller coaster these last four or five pages. Um, and ultimately, you know, it's going to play out the way that they want him to. Um, The doctor comes in, the doctor that we saw, uh, well actually it's a different doctor, but uh, Malcolm's speaking with this doctor about, um, we find out some, some of the, the backstory to Edward. We never meet Edward, but yet we see his ability to heal people. He's a good king, everybody loves him, Malcolm loves being there with him. You see how much difference these people think about Edward than they think about Macbeth? This is that foil that I was talking about, or this is a foil of Macbeth, this minor character, and this character we don't even see, actually. He has these traits that our main character does not have, okay? And that really showcases by how good these things are, it really amplifies how bad Macbeth truly is, okay? So that's, uh, that's Edward, and that's the last they really talk about him for the most part. Um, 384 and 385, <clears throat> the second half of this particular scene uh, the first half was the test. second half is kind of dealing with what's going to happen in the near future. Uh, Ross shows up here, um, you know, at, on 384. Uh, Macduff, see who comes here. Uh, it's my countryman, but yet I know him not. Oh, I know him now. So as he got closer, Malcolm recognized him. But good God, the times removed the means that makes us strangers. So it's been a long time that I, since I've seen you, Ross. And so, you know, I, time has made us forget or not recognize people. People have changed. Um, Macduff's question, stand Scotland where it did? Alas, poor country, almost afraid to know itself. It cannot be called our mother, but our grave. So once again, remember, Ross just shows up from time to time in very important scenes. And he usually comes with some news. He was the one who told Macbeth, you are now Thana Calder. He was the one who was with Lady Mac Macduff just the previous scene defending, you know, her husband, Macduff. Um, he just jumps around, jumps around, is important. He's the one that when uh, Macbeth was having his fit at the feast, he's the one that said, everybody, stand up, we need to go. He's, he's not, you know, so he's an important guy, an important thing, an important character, even though he doesn't have a whole bunch to, to say and do. Um, <clears throat> Malcolm, line 174, he's asking about Scott, you know, what's the newest grief? What's going on? Oh, that of an hour's age doth hiss the speaker, and each minute teems a new one. And so you ask me now, and I can only report on what happened that I know of, and that's bad. Each minute, there's something worse, so the news is old. It's like looking at a, a week-old newspaper. Oh, Scotland's horrible. Well, that was a week ago. There's a whole bunch of new stuff that's bad. And so um, Macduff asks, how does my wife, Ross, why, well, and all my children, well, too, the tyrant has not battered at their peace? No, they were well at peace when I did leave them. Is he lying here? On the next page, he's going to tell them that his family was killed. Did he just lie right there, do you think? They were well when I did leave them. Is that a lie? No. They were very fine. Okay, he was having conversations with them. Um, why doesn't he come right out and say it? I don't know. Um, you know, they talk, uh, Ross, his next little five or six lines deals with talking about how there has been open rebellion in Scotland, Macbeth. I've even seen some of Macbeth's armies marching to deal with those. So he's showing that there's some revolution, revolution um, and um, upheaval going on in the, in the country. So really, that's more important to the state of this conversation. Then he talks about it. So maybe he wanted to put the news first, uh, maybe the good, then the bad, good news, bad news type thing. Um, what I find interesting here is Macduff is surprised to hear that they're okay. The tyrant has not battered at their peace. They're, they're okay. Well, if you thought that there, something was going to happen and their lives were in danger, shouldn't you have taken them with you? You see what I mean? He's almost surprised that they were still alive. He's almost surprised that they were, you know, things weren't going well.
So when, you know, uh, we have McDuff really, uh, you know, kind of being surprised that this, nothing's happening. Wow, I would have thought the king would have done something about that. Huh, well, good. Like he was risking their lives, okay? But he is still crushed nonetheless when he hears, you know, a page from now and then the last page after that, you know, that they have died. But yet, by reading this line, I'm like, well, aren't you surprised that they died? Sure, you still have grief. Everybody would have grief. And you don't want your babes killed, your chicken, your chicks, he calls them, I think. You don't want those killed. But yet, it's kind of strange. Like, Macduff, did you not really think that that was going to happen? You knew that that was probably going to happen. Um, or else you would have taken them with you. Um, so 385, when he finds out about this, um, I, but I have words, the blue, that would be howled out in the desert air where hearing should not lash him. But folks, you know, I know that was good news, but I got some words that I, you know, I, they're not really going to be well received here. In fact, they would be better screaming them in the desert where nobody can hear them. They can just die and fade away. Oh, well, tell us about them. Um, tell us about them. And Macduff, if it be mine, keep it not from me. Quickly, let me have it. Let not your ears despise my tongue forever, which shall possess them with the heaviest sound that ever yet they heard. Hmm. I guess at it. Well, of course you guess at it. You were surprised a page ago. Okay. Um, your castle is surprised. Your wife and babe is obviously slaughtered. So everybody died. And, of course, he can't deal with this. It's rough. Malcolm even is like, use this for revenge. Use this. Take this hate and use it. Um, the next page, 386, um, Macduff has a line. He has no children. This can be interpreted in several different ways, one of which is, Malcolm, shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. You're a kid yourself. You don't have kids. You don't know what it is to lose your kids. That, that might be kind of harsh, and I don't know if Macduff is really at that part, point yet because we still see him lamenting and really sad and moody. moody. Um, I kind of think it's more about Macbeth has no kids, so he can't understand the, the torture that he just bestowed upon me. Maybe it's um, he has no kids, so I can't have any revenge. But again, that's too directed. Um, with, of anger right away, and I think he's still dealing with the, the shock of it. Um, you know, his main worry is line 2, uh, 23. Did heaven look on and would not take their part? He's worried that when they were killed, maybe heaven wasn't looking in their direction, and so maybe didn't allow them to, you know, ascend the pearly gates and such. Okay, so that was a big deal for him, and he, he hopes, you know, that, okay, well, hopefully they're in heaven, but he's like, oh, gosh, I hope heaven was paying attention to them. You know, my bays, my loved ones, you know, uh, I cannot but remember such things were that were most precious to me. I, I can't remember anything more important to me. And then that comes back to me thinking, well, why didn't you do something about it? Why didn't you take them with you? Okay? But then, you know, there, we wouldn't have this story. We wouldn't have this motivation uh, otherwise. Um, and then ultimately, Macduff, uh, you know, right there at the bottom, he goes, Bring thou this fiend of Scotland and myself within my sword's length set him. So bring this fiend, bring this fiend of Scotland, Macbeth, within my sword's length so that I can deal with it and, you know, get my justice, get my revenge, your vengeance, you know, pay back what he has done to me. Um, and so that's where we leave off everything ramping up for Act 5. So Macduff and Malcolm and Old Seward, they have an English army that's getting ready to march into Scotland to fight. We know that Macbeth is mobilized already fighting some revolutions. We know that Macbeth is extremely confident based on the witch's prophecy. Beware Macduff. Okay, well, I can beware that guy. All right, then we have the second one was the uh, you have nothing to fear of man born of woman. Well, everybody's born of a woman, so that's cool. Awesome, I feel powerful. And then lastly, you will never vanquish be till great Burnham Wood marches on Dunsinane. And so till the woods march across the field towards you, you're fine. This is what he's interpreting. That was the witch's motivation. They wanted him, needed him, because Hecate told him, you must tell him things that will make him extremely confident and arrogant when he should be wise. Okay, so that's the motivation to always be keeping in mind as we go through Act 5. Okay?